Ah, there you are. You're just in time. You see, a new 2D Mario and 2D Sonic were just released three days apart from one another. And as a fan of both franchises, you might think I'd be having some trouble choosing which game to try out first. <laughs> well, fear not, because if there's one thing I know how to do, it's make a decision. It's just always come naturally to me. So in my case, I'd obviously be starting with... Put, uh, well, well I, I guess on occasion, it, it doesn't hurt to consult a pros and cons list to weigh my options. Then again, a classic Venn diagram might be a better method to convey the information. Hmm. Though I could decide between them by assigning them both a number and using a random number generator to see which is closer. Actually, I could just as easily roll a pair of dice to see what I get. But why leave myself open to possible human error? Can't be too careful with a decision like this. Alright, I'm making this way too complex. I just need to decide which game to play first. And what I decide is... To find a coin to flip. Do any of you carry change? I'll make you eat those words! I know I'm a little bit late to the party, with these two titles having both been out for over a month or so, but I had some other new games to play beforehand, like... Well, the, the point is I've been busy. Though now my schedule is clear, and I've got all the time in the world to make a little side-by-side -side scrolling comparison. <laughs> oh dear, can you believe these videos aren't more popular? I can't think of a more apt example of a video game rivalry than that of Mario vs. Sonic. It's the go-to example. Which makes sense, since Sonic was conceptualized by Sega from the very beginning to be their answer to the portly plumber's success. And ever since then, the two have been duking it out in an eternal game of anything you can do, I can do... as well. Alright, maybe it hasn't been as close of a race as I'm making it sound, with Mario games maintaining a consistent level of quality across the board, while Sonic routinely struggles to find a more stable footing, so to speak. Though the pair have come together on a few occasions, for the Olympic Games or Smash Brothers, it's their inherently competitive relationship that makes them so ripe for comparison. Now, I don't want to get political, but given that I was introduced to Sonic first as a kid, I've always been partial to the Hedgehog's outings over what Nintendo was doing. Just my own preference. But that doesn't mean I was a stranger to Mario. I've played each release of both series like clockwork every time a new one hits the shelves. Which leads me to a bit of a fork in the road with their most recent platforming games. Super Mario Bros. Wonder and Sonic Superstars, coincidentally enough, seem to be built on the exact same foundation, revisiting what was originally appealing about their respective franchises while injecting new and eye-catching concepts to revitalize a tried-and-true formula. There was loads of excitement from longtime fans upon the two announcements, but as many began realizing that the titles would be releasing within the same week, an age-old feud was reignited. It was the same battle that's been raging for decades amongst nerds everywhere. Who's better, Mario or Sonic? Since I've been fortunate enough to get my grubby little hands on both games, I'd like to throw my hat in and provide a non-biased review of the two platformers at the same time. Since they seem to be brought up together often enough as it is, it only feels appropriate. Sort of a duo review, you could say. Is that a term? Well, it's my channel, so I'll call it what I want. The first to get announced was Sonic Superstars back in early June. Set to release on both PC and consoles, and be developed partially by Sonic Team, but with the lion's share of work being handled by third-party developer Arzest. Quite a thrilling time to be a Sonic fan, since the last official title was only out for about half a year before news of this little surprise came along. It was certainly unexpected, but the overall response to the trailer was very positive. Sonic fans ravenous for any kind of game in the classic style, since the incredibly successful Sonic Mania has been bizarrely snubbed by Sega, who show no signs of interest in any kind of sequel or follow-up, despite being the best-rated Sonic game for the last decade plus. I'm sorry, is my bitterness showing? Not even two full weeks later would there be a surprise waiting for viewers at the end of June's Nintendo Direct. It was a new Super Mario Bros. game. Uh, oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean like a, a new Super Mario Bros. game for the Switch. <laughs> uh, no, I... I uh, God. Why'd they ever stop using this naming convention? It's clearly aged so well. Super Mario Bros. Wonder was looking to be an evolution of what the new series were accomplishing in their heyday. With time taken out to showcase how they've tweaked major aspects that had been previously causing fatigue amongst fans, such as a new lively art style filled with tons of visual garnish, and unique level designs seemingly brimming with ideas we've never seen before. Both trailers received praise for their presentation, 
Certainly no one was railing against the use of 2D sprites in games like Sonic Mania, but the more contemporary 3D models helped superstars stand out from the rest of the series with a bright and eye-catching aesthetic, while Wonder seemed to have more character expressions than ever before, as well as more characters than ever before. Whatever side you landed on, there was something to look forward to here. A few months later, fans would finally get to try both titles for themselves. So, who got the better deal? By the way, I usually don't have to say this since I tend to only talk about things you'd find at a flea market, but I'm spoiling both of these games front to back, so if you're saving yourself from that, it's probably best to avert your eyes now. Let's quickly go over the stories of each game first, starting with Wonder. Mario and friends are visiting the Flower Kingdom and enjoying a tour from Prince Florian when Bowser suddenly attacks, using the mysterious Wonder Flower to combine himself with the kingdom's castle. In this form, he manages to steal all of the royal seeds, don't laugh, that of which our protagonists have to now go collect over six different hub worlds, all while saving the floral inhabitants and taking down the likes of Bowser Jr. along the way. Story information is delivered in dialogue boxes throughout the adventure, most of it coming from Prince Florian, who tags along as your guide. Though, as you'd expect, of course, there's not really a heavy focus on narrative here. Once in a while, they'll set up a small side character of sorts that'll pop up a few times to help you along the way. And Captain Toad also makes a non-playable appearance. Man's just showing up for the paycheck at this point, I guess. But otherwise, it's all just an excuse to get the ball rolling on the things they really wanted you to see. Across the pond, Superstars has a bit more to say, but doesn't quite know how to say it. Let me see if I've got this all right. Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and Amy are headed to the North Star Islands to stop Eggman's latest plot. You see, the Doctor had uncovered an ancient mural depicting a wall of beings that seemed to correspond with the Seven Chaos Emeralds. In the middle of this mural is a portrait of a gemstone that the all-powerful Black Dragon is sealed inside of. Eggman's goal is to harness the power of this dragon to use for himself. Enlisting the help of newcomer Trip, a shy and clumsy lackey who's clearly more than meets the eye. Sonic and friends now have to travel through 11 different zones while collecting the Chaos Emeralds and knocking around Eggman while they're at it. Oh, also, Fang's back, and they're hoping you don't ask why. It's cool to see him return after so many years, but man, I, I don't think he does anything in this story other than serve as mini-boss fodder. It's worth mentioning that most of the plot I've described thus far isn't actually told to you in the game itself, but rather a supplemental short released prior to Superstar's launch that acts as a prequel. The game does have animated cutscenes, but if you're going off of just these alone, all you know about what's going on is that Eggman's capturing big animals with Fang and Sonic's coming to stop him, making a lot of imagery and story beats feel like they come out of absolutely nowhere. Seems a bit odd to go through all that world building just to forego including most of it in the actual game. I had to look up a synopsis to get an idea of what was actually happening here since I guess it wasn't in their best interest to make that clear. I suppose this was their send-up to how stories were told back in the Genesis era, but at least then you kinda got the idea of what was happening without having to read a wiki page. Though, like Wonder, the story isn't why we're here, so I can deal with this fragmented approach. As I said before, there's a unique flair to the visual styles of both games, Mario Wonder upping the expressiveness of both the playable cast and Rogue's gallery of enemies to create a look that feels like it was ripped straight out of a cartoon having smooth animations complement the highly detailed environments in each stage, offering a wide breadth of variety and making it feel like you can instantly identify any given level just by seeing a brief snippet of it. The game also ran at a consistently smooth 60 frames on both my TV and in handheld mode, with no noticeable dips from what I could tell. I'm not usually a stickler for that kind of thing, but if they manage to pull off that stable of a performance the whole way through, that's worth admiring in my book. The soundtrack is just the kind of plucky, catchy tunes you'd expect in a Mario platformer. I still catch myself humming the main athletic theme, and the overall sound design is always on cue, with dynamic changes to the music tracks depending on things like what power-up you're currently using being nice touches. When things get a bit more surreal, there's plenty of accompanying odd noises and distorted vocals that really bring these moments together. As well as this being a rare instance of actual voice acting in a Mario game with these little talking plants you can find everywhere. So you can get over there. I was worried these things would get annoying, but they're used just enough to still be charming, though they were riding a fine line. It's apparent that a lot of this extra detail must have been a result of Nintendo's agreeable development cycle for this game, which began in 2019. 
There were no hard deadlines set for the team to rush their work in order to be finished by, instead giving them ample time to come up with tons of ideas and how best to implement them from a gameplay standpoint. A refreshing change from the dishearteningly crushing stories we usually hear from game developers. I feel knowing the people behind this were given a proper work-life balance makes it all the sweeter to appreciate. One could hope that the good press this aspect got would inspire other studios to follow suit. But if you believe that's going to happen, I've got a bridge to sell you. Superstars looks pretty solid as well. The colors absolutely pop, and I'll always appreciate fully animated cutscenes. There's a good sense of perspective too, and when things get a bit more visually abstract like in these special stages, there's still competent direction that keeps it from getting too confusing to keep track of. I'm not fully won over by the presentation, however. Character animations don't always feel like they're as smooth as they could be, sometimes coming off as a bit awkward to look at. It also doesn't help that the level themes don't exactly scream inspired, with the typical green grass zone, desert zone, snow zone, metal zone, casino, we've seen all these places before. And there isn't really a strong sense of originality to make it seem as if it was integral we recycle these environments from games past. When we do, on occasion, step away from the traditional settings, it can be conceptually interesting, but not quite enough to make the redundancy feel worth it. The game's performance also leaves something to be desired. I played the PC version on a perfectly capable machine, and while it did maintain a mostly stable 60 frames throughout the adventure, there were enough stuttering loading screens and visual glitches to be a legitimate problem. Stuff like the You Just Got a Chaos Emerald screen, mistakenly showing all of the Chaos Emeralds instead of the actual amount I had, for instance, happened several times. The soundtrack is also kind of a mixed bag for me. Don't get me wrong, there are some tracks in here I love. And to me, T. Lopes can do no wrong when he's at the helm, knowing exactly how to make his way into my brain with some of the catchiest compositions in the franchise. Jun Sinoe also has quite a track record. However, I feel like he doesn't always hit the mark when he's attempting to emulate the Genesis sound. It reminds me of tracks from Sonic 4 that try to have that classic twang, but really end up just feeling like pale imitations with overly repetitive melodies. I'm not a music connoisseur by any means, but I feel like I could, with reasonable confidence, be able to pick out which tracks were done by someone like T. Lopes. And which were done by June. I just really would have rather gotten a consistent feel throughout the whole experience. These composers are all terrific, but I think there's a bit of crossed wires going on here. The rest of the game's sound was on the mark. Things are mixed properly, which usually would go without saying, but with this guy you never know. However, I did come across a few instances where audio cues just wouldn't trigger, leading to long, awkward silences, or sometimes the music track would glitch out and play twice overlapping itself and creating a very annoying and very overstimulating tossed salad of noise. I think I've rattled on enough about the sights and sounds. Let's see how things go when you actually start pushing buttons. Gameplay-wise, there's a lot to unpack in both titles, so let's spend a little extra time in each. In Wonder, you get the choice of playing as a whopping 12 different characters the most in Mario platformer history by far, though unlike in previous adventures, each character doesn't have their own attributes, such as having a higher jump or a faster run. Nah, it's just a cosmetic choice this time around. That is, if you're playing as any of these guys. If you decide to venture to the back of the bus over here, you'll find a different crowd. The Yoshis and Nabbit can't pick up any power-ups, which is a pretty big blow, though in return for this, they also can't take damage from regular enemies. I guess they're meant to act like an easy mode in a way, but to me, it's more like we're neutering a big chunk of the gameplay. I don't think it's a very fun trade-off to not be able to use any of these interesting new power-ups just so I don't have to worry about losing any of them by getting hit. It's not like one of the optional super power-ups in previous games that makes you completely invincible for the purposes of helping you through a level. No, these traits are permanently tied to these characters. So if you wanted to play through the game as Yoshi, you're going to have to decide if that's something you can put up with. Maybe there's people out there who found this to make the game more accessible, but for me, it makes nearly half the roster unappealing. Granted though, if you do pick one of the Yoshis, you can use their trademark flutter jump or swallow and toss enemies and items, so there is something to make them more unique. Nabbit, on the other hand, can't do any of that. I don't know who he's here for, I, I didn't invite him. 
everyone controls very tightly. Nicely responsive, with the only traditional movement option absent here being the triple jump, but I found I wasn't missing it too much. Speaking of long time staples being cut, each level no longer has a timer, which I'm glad to see. It was starting to feel a bit archaic to still have around, and getting rid of it helps people explore at their own pace, especially since there's a lot more to uncover. It didn't take long after the game's opening for me to start noticing the potential of how much creativity was really being used here. Evidently, the development team had come up with nearly 2,000 ideas for the game's levels, leading to some of the most standout set pieces or remixed versions of typical Mario conventions we've seen in a long time. You've got your regular courses, where the goal is to get to the flagpole as always, but mixed throughout are shorter challenges you can find to keep things fresh, such as races against a wiggler, rooms of enemies you need to take out within a decent time to maximize your rewards, or puzzle courses that require you to find all the hidden coins to complete. These can get really cryptic. It wouldn't be a new Mario game without new power-ups though, and this time the main draw would be the elephant fruit. Increasing your character size and letting you swing your trunk to knock out enemies or even water some plants. I certainly didn't consider Elephant to be up next on the list of untapped potential for Mario power-ups, but I suppose that's the fun of it. Guess I'll just have to wait until next time for my long-requested Naked Mole Rat Mario. The Drill Mushroom and Bubble Flower are also great additions. I'm always a fan of power-ups that not only feel good to use against enemies, but also transform the way you can traverse through a level by opening up new movement options. For the regular collectibles, we've got these big purple 10 coins, three of which are hidden in the main courses. You can spend your purple coins at the shops on the world map, letting you buy things like extra lives, wonder seeds, which act as this game's main collectible obtainable through stages that you need to get a certain amount of at any given time to progress, or sometimes even badges. These badges are quite something. They're awarded to you throughout the game and are equivable at any time on any course. Outside of the aforementioned shops, you mostly unlock them by completing a challenge to demonstrate you know how to use it. Putting one on grants you additional abilities like letting you glide with your cap, giving you a grapple vine, or my favorite, a spin move that acts as a double jump. There's even more passive ones like giving you extra coins for stomping enemies or adding bonus blocks to each stage that contain goodies. In addition to this, for the chaotic evil out there, there's expert badges to spice things up a bit like making it so you permanently keep jumping or continuously sprint. These are a great way to make already replayable stages even more tempting to revisit in new conditions, or to up the mayhem meter if things are a bit too standard for you. Though standard is certainly not a word to use when it comes to the wonder flowers. These are collectible in nearly all of the stages and turn whatever level you thought you were playing completely on its head. It's almost impossible to explain what all this can do when you grab it. From changing the perspective, to the characters, to starting a full-blown musical, I don't know what's happening, this is where the game truly shines. You might have thought the last stage was as weird as it could get, but in a matter of minutes, you'll end up surprised in a completely different way. And that's very exciting from a gameplay standpoint. It was hard to put Wonder down at certain points. I'd find myself wanting to see what they could possibly come up with next. In what way could they delight me by willingly tossing away everything I've come to understand about the game thus far and hurling me into a technicolor dreamscape that celebrates the very idea of making the player go, what am I looking at? Sure, there's a lot of praise to be slung at Mario Wonder, but is there any left over at the table for Sonic and his pals? Over in Superstars, the roster of characters may be smaller, but they all control differently enough to make them each have merit from the first level to the final boss. There's no changing the game's rules around depending on who you pick, just the different movement options as players have come to expect. Sonic has his drop dash, Tails can fly for a short time, Knuckles can glide and climb walls, and Amy can double jump and use her hammer on enemies. Though what I was especially happy to see was the fact that you can now switch characters throughout your playthrough at any time. A first for 2D Sonic to not have you go through an entire campaign as the character you picked from the start and it only took them finally adding this feature for me to realize that it should have been in these games a long, long time ago. For those on the more obsessive side of the Sonic fandom, like myself, we could be sticklers for how close the physics are to the original games. And while no, this certainly isn't a one-to-one -one match, it's still very close. And it's still miles better than other classic Sonic interpretations we've seen. As mentioned, there's 11 total zones, most of which have two acts to complete. The general flow of these levels feels, for the most part, on point. There's different ideas being tossed out there that keep the player on their toes, some of which feel like fun extensions of a level's theme while being complementary to the gameplay, while others... Uh, suck. 
Sometimes there'll be bonus acts in a zone too, like stages tailor-made for a specific character to play through, or ones that reward you with a ton of bonuses that you need to find these hidden fruits in order to play, kind of like an entry pass. I recommend playing as Tails in these though if you're playing by yourself. Helps give you a fighting chance at hitting all of these balloons before the screen scrolls right past them. Returning from Sonic 1, again, are these bonus stages you can enter by passing a checkpoint with enough rings. You know, a surprising amount of time must have gone into designing these, because throughout my playthrough, I kept seeing more gimmicks added in. It got to the point where these bonus areas that I never really liked the design of prior were actually pretty engaging. Though I still prefer the old days where there were several different kinds of bonus rooms you could play in when entering from a checkpoint. It made them more tantalizing to try out. Whereas here, I, more often than not in the latter half of the game, ignored these rooms altogether since they were disrupting the flow of the regular gameplay for several minutes at a time. Outside of these bonuses are the more recognizable special stages in hidden giant rings that award you with Chaos Emeralds for completing. I don't know if it was just me, but these rings feel easier to find than ever before. I had no trouble locating enough to collect all seven Chaos Emeralds by about halfway through the game on my first playthrough, and I'm not sure if that was the intention. The simplicity extended into the special stages as well. I'm pleased to see that they came up with an original design, but even after getting every Chaos Emerald, I still don't think I get this. Let me explain. The concept is you grapple onto floating blue orbs in this 3D space until you get close enough to nab the emerald. It sounds cool on paper, but in practice, it takes really no skill. You just have to wait for that target reticle to pop up to keep swinging along. There's no special timing or anything. If you're making a beeline for the emerald, you're more than likely to get it within about 15 to 20 seconds without any real obstacles in your path. I kept thinking these were going to get tougher and demonstrate how they could build upon the concept, but nope, that was the last emerald. I guess that's all they've got. Though at least you're still rewarded with getting to play as Super Sonic for getting all seven, who's very fun to blast through levels with. Though I find that Super Knuckles and Super Tails both have an unsatisfying loss of momentum whenever they fly or glide that felt like getting stuck in molasses. For the first time ever, the Super Forms aren't the only reward for collecting the Emeralds. With each special stage you complete, you also get a new power along with your gemstone that's accessible through this selection wheel. If I had to compare them to something, I find these powers to be somewhat similar to having different boss weapons in the Mega Man games. There's some that felt great to use in any situation and can really save your ass, or let you skip huge chunks of the level. Then there's others that feel, we'll say, situational. But overall, I can appreciate how each one seems to be trying something different and how easy they are to swap between. So I wouldn't mind seeing this idea revisited in some form or another down the line. Something they can go ahead and leave behind though is the idea of these Sonic medals. The game gives these to you for doing almost anything. Get 100 rings? Well, you get a medal. Explore a tucked away area of a stage? There's a medal. Play the checkpoint bonus levels? Medals. Defeat a golden enemy in the stage? More medals. Fruit levels shower you in medals. Dear God, there's even blue versions of these special stage rings you can get that award you with yet more medals for completing. I was collecting a ton of these things before I had even realized what they were used for. Taking time out to gather as many as I could with hopes that they may serve as some kind of currency to get cool in-game perks or power-ups. Well, they serve as a currency all right, but only to buy what is probably the least exciting thing they could have thought of. Superstars has a somewhat fleshed out online multiplayer, if you can believe it. You pick your avatar and compete through a set of three different game modes that cycle each time you play. Facing off against other players around the world is the idea, but when I played on a weekday evening, only a few weeks after release, mind you, I couldn't find a single other person when queuing up. I played with just bots like a lonely creep, but I think I get the picture. These are about as realized as maybe the chow races from the adventure games, except more hands-on. Though, it's just that even if I did have a full lobby, and even if it was a full lobby of friends, I don't see this as holding the attention of your average online gamer for very long. There's way better options out there with a much longer shelf life. And honestly, I don't think anyone's looking to Sonic to supply this kind of thing. I respect them for trying new ideas, but this was a bit too distant from where I think the core strength of the game should have lied. The only reason I bring up all this online stuff now is because those medals that are all over the main campaign serve only to be exchanged for body parts you can customize your online character with, and that's it. That's their only purpose. That means if you're someone who has zero interest in online battle, which, oh, I'll go out on a limb and say is most people, you now have a major collectible that serves absolutely no purpose at all. 
I don't mind them putting extra effort into different game modes, but if a huge chunk of the main game's only purpose is to give you optional cosmetics for playing online with, it feels like they vastly overestimated how much people would be flocking to this, frankly, underwhelming part of the package. Oh, and you need an Epic Games account to even play it at all, so just don't worry about it. If you want multiplayer, try it local. Something that Sega are leaning heavily towards with this game's ad campaigns. Play with your friends, play online, but you can't play online with friends in the main campaign. What the f man, you were so close. It would have been a major feather in this game's cap to be able to play multiplayer through these stages without having to all be in the same room. Those who played this game on PC could have really benefited from that. In my case, I don't really see inviting friends over just to huddle around a computer screen. It also could have helped parlay people into that battle mode that's just over there begging for someone to care about it. Turns out, I just had to wait until Wonder to experience online integration that understands its own appeal. You can choose to have it on or off at any time, and by turning it on, you welcome in players from all over the globe to join you on your adventure. It's not quite like local multiplayer that forces you to stick together and complete levels at the same pace. You do get bonus points for things like beating the stage at the same time, or helping revive players who get knocked out by touching them while they're in ghost form, but ultimately it's kinda like you're just passing by each other out of coincidence. They also let you drop these standees that you can collect a wide variety of that help you revive your fellow players if you're not available to do so yourself. For how many of these there are, it kind of feels like they'd have a bit more of a purpose in standard gameplay, but it's still satisfying to complete a set nonetheless. It's kind of an interesting social experience, one that promotes friendly gameplay. Everyone I came across seemed to take time out to help show other players secrets or to help revive each other at particularly difficult spots. For those who may not have anyone they can play with locally, this could be a fun way to get that shared experience without any of the potential madness that Couch Multiplayer Mario usually delivers. Although here, it's a bit less chaotic than previously with a new follow the leader type of camera setup that makes it so whoever is ahead, or whoever got higher on the flagpole in the previous level, is centered on the camera at all times. I think this is a nice remedy to the usual method of having the camera try to follow around four points of interest at a time with no real focus. And the fact that the leader can change at any point avoids it feeling like one player is benefited above anyone else. With all these clever design philosophies, it seemed a spotlight was being shed on one aspect of the game I felt was a bit undercooked. With how off the wall Wonder can get in its courses, I was kind of expecting to see a bit more of that craziness in the bosses, but they don't really push for that very hard. It's often that you're just fighting a slightly different variation of the first Bowser Jr. fight with different effects going on. And while it isn't bad, in a game that relishes in the absurd, it comes off as a bit tame. How great would it have been to see regular stage enemies getting the Yoshi's Island treatment and being transformed by the Wonder Flower into monstrous versions of themselves? We see stuff like that going on in the stages, but as far as bosses go, it's a little bit barren. I've also seen people saying this game would have been a great opportunity for the Koopalings to return to get their own Wonder treatment. Which, yeah, would have been cool to see how they came up with each boss fight. In an otherwise exceptionally inventive game, it's strange to see such a blatant missed opportunity. Superstars, on the other hand, doesn't miss a single one of those opportunities to throw a new boss in your direction. They've got everything from eh to ugh. Sonic bosses have always been hit and miss, but we're missing a lot more than we're hitting here. Some of these can drag for eternity. I couldn't believe how long they'd go on for. Every hit I'm hoping to myself, that's it. That's the last one I need. Only to discover, no, I've got to wait through their entire 30 second attack loop at least one more time. And it was so draining. The Chaos Emerald powers do help add some level of strategy to beating the mid and late game fights, but when you can only sneak a few hits in before having to wait again, there's not much you can do to spice things up for yourself. That is, when it's not just randomly shifting gameplay styles for a Fantasy Zone reference. Normally, I'd be a bit taken aback by this sudden change, but it's kinda like being served a plate of saltine crackers after several courses of slow-roasted sludge. Sure, it's pretty bland, but at least it's a palate cleanser. Gotta give it to him though, there is a much greater variety here compared to Wonder's bosses, surprisingly enough. Continuing all the way to the end game, where I noticed something was missing. For the most part, it's pretty by the books. A big bombastic Eggman boss battle, which again, drags, that leads to our heroes escaping last minute and considering the day saved. That all taking place after we see the defeat of Fang at the hands of the reformed Trip who reveals herself to be one of the ancient figures known as the Sun Gazers, that of which possess an ancient power to transform into dragons using the Chaos Emeralds. Thank God for the wiki, right? Because none of that was explained in-game. All I knew is that this girl just turned into a golden dragon and she's on our side now. Okie dokie. 
After beating the main campaign, you unlock Trip as a fifth playable character who fits in with the rest of the cast just fine. She has a double jump like Amy, but can stick to walls, making her a pretty versatile pick. You can also fly around as Dragon Trip when you use her super form, but I think it's pretty clear to see the level design just doesn't agree with that idea. It's cool they give you a chance to try her out in the unlockable Trip Story mode, which is a new game plus with slightly tweaked levels and bosses. Yeah, it's neat and all, but remember when I mentioned something was missing? That something being the age-old tradition of having a Super Sonic final boss. Nearly every Sonic game has had one since the 90s, and after collecting all of the emeralds, I was waiting to see when it was going to pop up, losing hope by about halfway through the staff credits. Any minute now. Well, it would come as my surprise that there is indeed a Super Sonic boss fight, but it's locked behind beating the entirety of Trip's story. Just to be clear, the true final boss of Sonic Superstars is inaccessible until you beat the entire game a second time in a slightly alternate game mode. Boy, am I glad they handled it this way, because I hate good ideas. Since when is that how it works? It was always just collect the Chaos Emeralds and you get the real ending. It was this blatant padding that really helped me isolate my feelings about this game altogether. Because being faced with having to repeat the whole thing from the beginning only had me wincing at the thought. Not a great way to cap things off. The thing is, I'd be happy to do more playthroughs of Wonder to see what I may have missed the first time. There's no hiding final bosses behind anything here other than your own skill. Once you beat the gauntlet of courses leading up to Castle Bowser, you take him on an ad admittedly creative final boss. Even if I feel it may lack a smidge of the grandeur we're used to seeing in Mario finales. After you send King Koopa packing, the Flower Kingdom is saved and Mario and his posse go home, feeling thankful that they no longer have to worry about being poached for their ivory. Outside of the six main worlds, there is a special world, a longtime Mario staple, with much more difficult stages to clear. There's some Kaizo-level difficulty you can find here, and while it's still fun and fair, they're clearly the hardest challenges an official Mario game has offered in decades. I kinda like it. Separates the boys from the men, and I clearly know which category I'm in. There's plenty of accolades being given to Super Mario Wonder, and I think that's only appropriate. Creativity like this should be rewarded, building a game around the fact that most people who are going to play it already get how your standard Mario works. So knowing that going in, they could put their full attention towards subverting those expectations. Having this title's identity be built around the concept of pure wonder was an exceptionally clever way to make these subversions feel central to the theme at all times, no matter how far-fetched they can be. This opened up so many doors that only really required the developer's imagination in order to take advantage of. And luckily, they were in no short supply of that. While I don't think every aspect of wonder was kept at this same gold standard of innovation, it's mostly because what's good here is so good that you only want to see more. So if something ends up being just fine, it feels more like a blemish rather than simply untapped potential. I know there's more to see in Superstars, but I just couldn't be bothered. I don't mind hopping right back in for another playthrough with the likes of Sonic 3 or Mania, but Superstars just doesn't feel like it's as tight of a package. It's like if Sega made an entire game out of classic Sonic's levels and generations and just tweaked the physics, with no discernible identity to make things feel like 30 years have passed since the conception of the franchise. I feel people aren't going to remember this title as fondly as other entries. A big reason being far too much of its focus is spent on appealing to the multiplayer options. You can feel it in the main campaign at points, and definitely with the meager online mode having an overabundance of collectibles that only exist to justify it. We've stretched the allure of 2D Sonic too thin here, and in the wrong directions. It's because of this that the bullet points they were hoping to cross off end up only being partially completed, with their supplemental offerings taking away from the proverbial main course that was always going to be the strongest reason anyone would boot this game back up years down the line. In the state that it is, I don't see myself revisiting this anytime soon, since I feel that everything it's doing has been outdone by titles with not only more polish, but that ask for a much lower price. Seriously, $60, guys? That was a bit of a stretch for Frontiers to pull off. Now you're just getting an ego. It's not much of a photo finish in this race, and the decision is definitely not split. Wonder wins by a wide margin, and I've gotta say, as a lifelong Sonic fan, it deserves it. I love the idea of both of these games. They created retro throwbacks that are more than just nostalgia bait. They're love letters to longtime fans while being welcoming invitations for new ones even if one of the invitations wasn't written very well. Where they branch off from one another is in their execution. A project like this is nothing without a strong foundation. And out of the gate, Wonder stood proudly by what it was. 
It's almost as if gameplay ideas were built around the reactions Nintendo knew they wanted to get, perhaps a direct result of the heavy criticism 2D Mario had been receiving for a while. If people think you're getting too stale, take a step back and workshop ideas that stem from what folks enjoyed about you to begin with. And if it takes a little extra time, in the end, it's always worth it. Sega isn't ashamed of superstars by any means, nor should they be. But from watching development interviews and reading about what inspired the team the most throughout the process, I can't help but feel like there's a chronic case of old versus new plaguing the final product. Rather than letting fresh ideas complement the familiar structure, there's a clash between where things are leaning towards the traditional and something else entirely. I mean, dear God, if you can't even get a stable impression from the soundtrack, then what does that tell you about the central theme of the game's design? This needed a rework, or at the very least, more time to improve what's already here. I wouldn't call it a low point in the series. Rock Bottom's been well achieved and surpassed by now, but more so stagnation. The game is getting decent enough reviews, so if people enjoy it, that's great. But personally, I think what they're going for here deserved more. Eh, don't feel bad, Sonic fans. The story has always kind of gone like this. The immaculate quality demonstrated by Mario games in a seemingly effortless fashion consistently overshadows whatever may be cooking in Sega's camp. It's been like this since these two were just pixels, and there's a bizarre comfort to the cyclical nature of this back and forth. There'll never be a time where Mario and Sonic aren't some of the biggest names in gaming, and there'll never be a time when they're not duking it out. At least, I hope not, because we've seen both franchises learn and grow from one another in more than a few ways. And it's in part because of this constant rivalry that they're both still going as strong as they are, whipping out new games that, once again, have them being compared to each other like the good old days. I don't know if I've ever seen a set of games pleading to square up against one another as much as these two so clearly are. And while the obvious winner may have been apparent from the start, it was still fun to explore what both have to offer, and endlessly entertaining to see that the old pros have still got it. Oh, oh, wait! I completely forgot to mention the random LEGO tie-in skins you can get in Superstars. Th that's gotta adjust the scores at least somewhat. See, I, I knew I was jumping to conclusions. We've hardly scratched the surface on a big decision like this. And to think I was about to wrap things up. Well, no, sir. I am going all night until I can make this choice properly. I don't care how long this video gets, I will comb every detail I can until I have all the information I need and absolutely nothing will cut me off once I get myself started. Okay, I, I get what you did there and it's funny and all, but we, we still have some things to discuss. I know you're making the music louder. We must treat this decision with the respect and dignity it deserves and discuss it like educated people. How do you make this thing stop spinning already?